Welcome to the Mind Craft Podcast. My name is Kimberly Quinn, and I have the honor and the pleasure and the privilege of having a, a dear friend on today, and his name is Paul Fortune. And Paul is going to talk to us today about don't give up your life pen as it is your story to write. And first of all, Paul, I'd like to say thank you for being a guest on the Minecraft podcast. Kim, I've been looking forward to this for weeks. You know, you and I have been talking about it, and I know that you and I together, we're going to have a blast. So I'm so excited to dive into this. This is going to be great. 100%, 100%. And so, Paul, yeah, I think you and I were talking about this, and I've heard you, um, what, you know, what prompted having you on here is I've heard you in person speaking, and your story is so freaking impressive that, you know, I wanted to have it on the show. So let's start off with the big question, which is what did you do to take up your pen? Yeah. And, and as I told you off air, Kim, uh, if you want to uh, ask me questions while I'm going through this, please do. I, it doesn't, that doesn't throw me off. So, um, yeah, to answer your question on that is, um, I was born with something called cerebral palsy. And, uh, if your viewers don't know what cerebral palsy is, it's lack of oxygen to the brain at labor. And as a result of this lack of oxygen at the brain at labor, it can leave one side of the body paralyzed. And uh, these, this is permanent. This doesn't go away. You have it for life. So when I was born, um, I really wasn't moving the right side of my body very much. And naturally, my mother was concerned about that. So she took me to the doctors to get testing done. And that's when I was diagnosed with the cerebral palsy. And this particular doctor... Uh, my cerebral palsy was so severe that he thought that uh, I would never be able to walk and it would be a good idea to get me in a wheelchair because that was going to be my life going forward. And uh, I've had many conversations with my mom about that. And naturally, she was devastated hearing that news. What was the life going to be for her baby boy? What the life was she, he going to live? And she cried herself to sleep. She said the next morning, as she woke up and, and got me ready for the day, I, I gave her a look, a look if to say, mom, don't let this be my story. I want to walk. And at the time I'm, I'm an infant. I can't talk yet. But she said, I gave her a look like, do not give up on me. I want to walk. And she said that mama bear inside of her started roaring. So she got a second opinion, a third opinion, a fourth opinion, a fifth opinion, finally found a physician willing to help. And with this physician's help, and me doing physical therapy four to five times a week, and my mom's unrelentless attitude to make sure I was walking. I was walking between age two and three, a feat that four of the doctors said it was impossible for me to do what I was doing. And that was huge. Obviously, though, at, at that young of age, I don't really remember that that much, but I do remember roughly when I was about five years old being put into soccer. And at the time, I probably could run, I don't know, about 25 to 50 yards before my leg would give out. And I didn't have so much pain, I couldn't go any further. So basically on the soccer field, I'm standing there while kids are playing soccer around me. I'll never forget this, Kim. But one day, I was just fed up. And, and I, I was going to go to my mom after practice. And I was going to tell my mom, Mom, I don't want to play soccer more. This is ridiculous. I won't play, right? And I remember what my mom told me. Because it's, it's held true to this very day. She said, Paul, if you don't want to play soccer anymore, that is fine. You don't have to. But you need to honor your commitments. So you need to finish out that soccer season. If you do not want to play soccer after that, that is fine. And I'm 43 years old and I haven't played soccer since that season. <laughs> but I did honor my commitment. And that, that, like I said, that's helped me through my life and my personal and my business life about honoring commitments. But I got a big break right after that soccer season. I got surgery on my right foot, got to tighten up the tendon, give me a little bit more spring in my step and take away the pain I was feeling when I ran. And I didn't know how crazy of a, a change this was, but this was a game changing surgery for me. It, it was huge. It, it just changed my life. Um, I didn't know this until my first day at PE. I, I switched schools at the time. I'm in first grade and the teacher, we do our stretches and the teacher goes, okay, guys, run a lap. And I'm thinking to myself, oh no. Here we go again. I'm going to run 25 to 50 yards. I'm going to stop. And these kids are going to look at that. and They're going to start teasing me again. But because of the surgery was different, I was able to go past that point where I normally have to stop. 
And I remember saying to myself, come on, Paul, you got this, bud. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. And I finished the lap with the other kids. On the outside, I kept cool. But on the inside, I was like, yes, 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 yes. The first time in my young life where I fit in, I didn't stand out. I was just one of the other kids. And things did get easier for me, no question about it. But I wouldn't consider me easy. My parents got divorced when I was uh, in uh, fifth or sixth grade. So I had to switch schools. And that's a tough age to switch schools because kids are becoming teenagers. Mm -hmm. They're going through hormonal changes. And a lot of them have been going to school with each other for years already. So they already formed their cliques and they don't have time for anybody new. So just being a new kid alone in that situation is going to be hard, right? But I'm a new kid who holds his right arm a little bit differently and walks with a little bit of a limp. So when I came into this school, I was bullied, teased, spit on, tackled. You name it, they did it to me. It was just unbearable. I remember crying myself to sleep most nights going, why me? Why do I have to go through this? While this is going on, I was raised Catholic, so my mom wanted me to go to a Catholic high school. So I had to take an assessment test to see where they were going to place me when I got to high school. Well, Kim, I... Must have bombed it because when I met with the principal and my mom, the principal tells the both of us that uh, she's going to put me at the lowest level possible and she doesn't expect much from me. I do not seem like I'm in college material after one test. This principal says this to me. Wow. So now I think I'm stupid. I'm going back to a school that does not accept me. I have no friends. I have nothing, right? The only people that, uh, that, I, that, I, that I'm associating with was sports. I, I, I was in, in, in the sports and I was – pretending that I was part of these teams and they were, you know, rooting for me because that was all I had. But the start of eighth grade, I was just sick and tired of feeling angry and sad all the time. I, I knew deep down those weren't my go-to emotions, but I didn't know how to change it. And I thought, well, what if I set a goal for myself and I focus in on that goal and that will help me kind of ignore that noise. So I thought, well, what can my goal be? And as I told you, I, I love sports, and particularly I loved baseball. So I thought, well, what if I try to make my varsity baseball team in high school when I got to high school? So I started playing fall ball, winter ball, spring ball, and if I wasn't doing that, I was throwing a tennis ball against the wall. And while I'm going through this journey, a coach comes to me and says, Paul, you play a lot of baseball. I go, yeah. And he goes, do you have any goals with that? And at the time... I didn't want to tell him that my goal was to make my varsity baseball team because I thought he, me with cerebral palsy, he'd be like, man, that, that ain't going to happen. And he'd laugh at me. But he kept asking me that question. He asked me that, I can't believe he asked me that about three or four times. And one day, he kept me at a weak moment. And I just blurt out that I want to make my varsity baseball team. And I'm like, oh my God, I just said that? Oh my God, 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 oh my God. And he didn't laugh at me. He paused for a second and he said, that's doable. And I'm like, what? That's doable? He goes, that is 100% doable. But you have to keep, other people have to keep you accountable for this goal. And I'm like, what do you mean by that? Other people keep me accountable for this goal. He goes, Paul, it's tomorrow after practice. You're going to go in front of your team and you're going to tell the team, that is your goal, to make your varsity baseball team. I'm like, no, 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 no. They just start to accept me, right? I've, I've been playing uh, um, baseball with these kids for a few for a few seasons now. They're starting to accept me, tease me less. If I say something like that, they're going to start teasing me again. And he said, Paul, there's going to be times when you're going through this journey where you're not going to be feeling it. And you're going to need your teammates to pick you up and push you forward on those moments. They need to know about your goal. So I said, okay. So I reluctantly, after practice the next day, and I'm shaking. I am just shivering. People were looking at me like, what the heck is wrong with you, Paul? Because I knew after practice I was going to have to tell them you know, about making the varsity baseball team. So after practice comes... And I blurred out that I want to make the varsity baseball team in front, in front of the team. And they didn't laugh at me either. They started clapping for me and cheering for me. And I know this now. I didn't know this when I was going through this. But I started to 
gain confidence in myself that I didn't have before. I, I shoulders back, my head up. So I started sending a different energy out towards these kids. And as a result of this new energy I was sending out towards these kids, these kids started sending me a different energy back. Mm -hmm. In other words, instead of bullying and teasing me, they started rooting for me. So my middle school career was much, much different than my high school career, all because of how I carried myself as a human being. And that alone, Kim, is the win. But the cherry on top was I was able to make my varsity baseball team as a junior and a senior. In my senior year, I pitched a three-hit shutout. They pour the Gatorade on me, and I felt so alive. I felt so good. It was the, one of the best feelings I've ever had in my life. I could still feel it today. Oh, oh my God. Goosebumps. It's just a, it was a wonderful, wonderful feeling. I graduate high school, and I start reflecting on that goal that I set for myself. As I told you, um, I didn't think I was going to make that goal uh, a reality. It was just a way to ignore the noise. But I was mm -hmm. able to achieve that goal. So I started to think to myself about what that principal said to me years earlier about not being college material. Uh, Kim, I, I was not a great student um, because in the back of my head, I thought to myself, well, you know what? I'm not very smart. So, and I'm not college material. So why try? Just do enough to stay eligible to play baseball and, and get on with yourself because that, that wasn't going to be your reality. You weren't going to be in college. But I thought, you know what? If I was able to make this goal a reality, which I never thought was going to be possible, why can't I set another goal for myself to say that I am college material? So I enrolled into a junior college because that was the only place that would accept me at the time. I got myself a math tutor. I got myself an English tutor. I went to the math lab. I did everything necessary to increase my grade point average. And with this hard work, I took my barely a 2.0, if not lower, all the way to 3.5, where I was able to transfer to a four-year university, graduate, and become college material. And I still wanted to go back. I still wanted to go back to that principal and say, see, see, you were wrong. I was college material. But you know, I thought about that, Kim. And I and I thought, you know what? I should thank her. Because all through college, yeah. I just heard her voice say that I'm not college material. And my next thought was, I will show you that I am college material. So her voice helped me get through college faster with a lot of motivation because I wanted to prove to her that I was college material. So I forgave her and I move on. And now I'm 22, 23 years old and I have no idea what the heck I want to do with my life. I'm like, oh, I graduated college. Okay, the doors should open now. Well, right, I, right. I, I don't know now. So um, I'm out. I'm out and about, and uh, a family friend of mine comes to me and goes, "Hey, uh, we're hiring uh, mortgage loan officers. Um, you know, we can hire you." You know, he was a CEO of a small bank, and I'm like, "Why not? I got nothing going on. Let's go. Let's try this." So I'm so excited to 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 have this job because it was my first time. I mean, guys, I worked at fast food. I worked at different places, but it was my first time wearing you know, business clothes to work. So I was so excited to dress up with business clothes and have a business job and this and that. And I get to get to the, get to uh, the bank and uh, no one at the bank wants to talk to me. I'm sitting alone at lunch. They barely want to even look at me. I'm like, what in the heck is going on? I haven't felt this way since junior high, middle school. What the heck is going on now? Why, why am I feeling that way? And I found out quickly what the problem was. They knew that I knew the CEO of the company. So it wasn't because of my talents. It's because of who I knew. So what they were going to do is they were going to chew me up and spit me out because I didn't belong there. I, I, I didn't deserve to have the position that I had, which I was pretty much a receptionist learning, whatever. But anyway, they, they, they thought I, I shouldn't belong there. But I proved to them, I was going to prove to them that, that I did belong there. So I had a positive attitude. I didn't complain about the workload. And from afar, because they didn't want to talk to me, I was observing what the top loan officers did at the bank. And I'll never forget my first day of, of uh, wanting to get, uh, go out and get loans for the first time. I had my rate sheets ready. I was going in to go out the door and, and, and start selling. And I remember my family friend, the CEO, says, st stops me and, and goes, what are you doing? And I go, I got my rate sheets and I'm going to go out and sell. I'm ready. And he's like, whoa, 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 wait, 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 wait. You need a lot more training. You are not ready yet. 
let's get you a little bit more training and then we'll then we'll well, then we'll send you out there and i'm like no 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 no. i got this i am ready to go let me go out the door i got it <laughs> i love it and he's like okay go <clears throat> and kim he was 100 percent right and i was zero percent right <laughs> i needed very little training I was I was falling over my words left and right. These clients that I was trying to sell to, they were abusing me because I had no idea what the heck I'm talking about, right? But once we go by and I started to realize what value I could add to these clients. And slowly, very slowly, I started bringing in loans and then more loans and more loans and more loans and more loans. And then two years later, I become a top producer in, in the big. And the people who didn't want to talk to me when I first got there are now coming to me with questions on how I was able to get so many so many loans in such a fast, excuse me, in a fast clip. And I love what I do. I I, I absolutely thought this was going to be my life's work. I love getting up. You know, some people hate Mondays. I loved Mondays. I couldn't wait to get to for Mondays because you know what? I was driving around all, all over Southern California. I was going to different places to eat, talking to different people. I loved it. I think I thought, oh, th th this is work. This is sign me up. I am ready. Then 2008 hit, and the economy yes. tanked it, and that whole bank that I was working for went belly up. It it didn't exist anymore. So all of us had to find different jobs, and I would be in another job, and that company went belly up. And this happened like three or four times, and I was really losing the luster uh, of of the business. And while this was going on, I wasn't working at such – that was a great company to work for at the time. And some of these other companies I was working for after that weren't as fun to work for as it was at this first company. And uh, I was no longer living for Mondays. I was dreading Mondays. I was – matter of fact, Sunday evening, I, I call it the Smonday Blues where you stop enjoying <laughs> the day with your friends and family and you start stressing over all you have to do Monday to the point where – Monday. It's Monday. You like that? Yes, because you're kind of blending. Yeah, yeah, you're blending. Yeah, you're, you, the, the weekend's over when it's Monday hits. It's, it's, like you're Monday. working into the, the doom, right? When it's a doom, yeah. And then you start thinking, <laughs> and you lose, and then you and then you lose sleep because you stress over the Monday, and then you wake up all groggy in a bad mood, and you, the week just starts on the bad foot, and it just it just was just was really really bad. I was still really successful at it because I, I, you know, because I'm I'm really good at talking to people and, and I really knew the products and I, and I and I worked hard, um, but I really wasn't enjoying myself. And things changed for me. One of the last places I was at, they brought in this uh, motivational speaker, this speaker to come talk to us. And and uh, at first, I'm like, I told my boss, I'm like, ah, yeah, I don't need this motivation stuff. Okay, I am self motivated. Uh, I got work to do. I don't want to come here, blah, 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 blah. And he goes, it's mandatory. You got to be there. So I said, okay, fine. But, you know, I made a pact with myself. Since I have to be there, I'm going to go all out and listen to what this guy has to say. I, I, I don't know why I said that to myself, but I intentionally said that to myself before I walked in that room. I'm like, you know what? If I have to be there, let me get some value out of it. So let me just stop what I'm doing and really take it in. And so I get in there, and the guy does his presentation, and the guy blew me away. The guy was tremendous. The guy was awesome to the point where I had to go talk to him afterward. And the guy was so cool. He uh, allowed me to pick his brain a little bit, and he said he started as a, as a, as a life coach, whatever. And I'm like, what the heck? A life coach? What the heck are you doing? Life coach? What is that? And explain that to me, and I'm thinking, you know what? This sounds really interesting. I like this. I, I want to explore this, right? So I started to get my coaching certificate, and I started telling people uh, that I knew in my circle and in business. And I said, you know what? I, I, I one day I want to get into to this coaching thing. And you know, the people in the mortgage industry—they're humoring me. They're going, "Okay, uh, okay, coach. Okay, go ahead and <laughs> save the world." But before you do that, can you bring a few loans in here, will you? So nobody was taking me seriously. Um, and then I made a conscious decision. Oh, 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 so I started doing it. So I started doing it part-time. 
and I was go- and I was doing the mortgage half the time because I thought, you know what, I got to pay the bills. So let me do the mortgage stuff, and then I'll do this part time, right? And uh, the last place I was at uh, was a bigger bigger establishment, and the legal team saw that I had this side gig because I put it on some of my social media, and they, they monitor all your social media. Uh, but I didn't think it was going to be an issue. Um, and they uh, they they called me into their office and said, "Hey, what is this this coaching thing that you're doing?" I explained exactly what I was doing. And they said, this could be a conflict of interest. We're going to have to investigate this further. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, that doesn't sound good. Right. And they came back with this five-page report of what I could and couldn't say. And I'm like, I looked at this report. I'm like, there is no way I'm going to make any coaching. uh, I'm going to make any traction in the coaching world if I follow this to the T. So I had to make some changes. So for a year, I just did mortgages. Didn't do anything coaching. Just did mortgages. But what I was doing was I was paying off all my debts. All my debts. And a year later, I was very fortunate that I was able to pay off all my debts. And I quit. And um, I actually had a really good year in the mortgage industry. I, I actually made President's Club, and I was supposed to go on um, this this cruise. And people are, are, are saying to me, like, Paul, you're crazy. You just made President's Club. Uh, you know, you're just a little burnout. You know, you're going to go on this ship. And, uh, you know, you'll feel better and you'll get back refreshed and be ready to go. And I'm like, no, I, I don't think so. I, I don't want to go on the trip. Uh, I want to quit. And uh, they're like, okay. And then I go, but you'll be back. This uh, coaching thing is pie in the sky nonsense. And um, I said, well, maybe so. It might be, but uh, I, I have to get it out of my system. I have, to, I have to really give it a go. And they're like, okay, well, you'll be back. All right, so, okay. And Kim, for a long time, I thought they were right. Um, I thought I was going to have to go back to the mortgage industry um, because I wasn't getting any coaching clients, no traction. Um, I was doing delivery service for food, different places. I was delivering to people that I went to high school with and people I knew in the community. And, um, you know, they were saying, oh, man, times must be tough for you and this and that, and I and I didn't have time to really explain, you know, what I was doing, why I was doing it, because uh, I had to make a certain amount of deliveries because I, I needed a certain amount of money to for my bills. And I remember times in my car on like Sunday Sunday evening, crying myself in my car, going, "What the heck am I doing? I made great money in the mortgage industry. Now I'm doing this, and now I'm delivering food. I'm not making any money in the coaching industry." Um, I think I think this is enough. This is not this is not this is not good. This is not what I want to do. And I did some soul searching, and I and I said to myself, "Well, um, have I did, done everything that I can do?" And I started to think about um, me having cerebral palsy. I wasn't telling my story um, because all through growing up, all I wanted to do was fit in. I didn't want to stand out. I just want to be like everybody else. So me telling that story, uh, I'd be almost in tears because I didn't want anybody to feel sorry for me. But I thought, the only how do I expect people to be vulnerable with me if I'm not vulnerable with them? Right. So I started telling my story. I started going podcasts. I started going all over where I could tell my story. And at first, I had so much emotion uh, through the story, and it was hard for me to get it out. But after a while, telling my story over and over again, it started to get easier for me. And, 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 and people started to relate to me. And I'll never forget my first client I ever got um, said to me, Paul, I, I don't have cerebral palsy, but I have X, Y, and Z. And I would be honored if uh, I could hire you as a coach. And, and that just built so much momentum for me. Started getting more clients. Uh, I actually hired a, a business coach. And uh, it's taken my, my business, my speaking gig to heights that, that I never, never dreamed about, and, and I'm so glad that I kept on the path. And now I'm talking to my good friend Kim on her podcast. And I'm so grateful that I'm on right now. Oh my gosh, Paul! I just just hearing this story um, again. I actually, I actually sort of sifted through it with some things I didn't hear the first time. Mm-hmm. With uh, the pitching mound, three uh, no hitter there. What you closed basically? It was a three hit shutout. So I, I three hit shutout. 
Yeah, I, I, I pitched the whole game, didn't give up a run, and only gave up three hits. It was, it was God. Really my best my best performance ever. Like, I don't know how I missed that the first time. But I mean, that's I'm a baseball person, too. That's just so super impressive. And so I, what, what were my questions? I made a few notes here because – um, that because the get use the word game changing with the surgery. Mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, you had that sort of aha moment when you were running, um, and you just all of a sudden you went past what you would usually done, you had usually done, right? Yep. Um, and I wonder, like, what, what went through your head, Paul, that was, um, because it sounds like that was pivotal for you, like, that really. I must like hear the Rocky theme song, you know, like you, you, <laughs> no, but, but you made a shift. You actually yeah. made a shift. So what, like, what was your inner dialogue with that? Well, like I said, like uh, before that point, I probably could only run 25 to 50 yards. I mean, I, I had to do some physical therapy, so I really never tested my running skills at that point. So I s just assumed that it would be like it was before. I really, you know, like, at the time when I had the surgery, I mean, like, I, I, you know, I really didn't know really about the surgery. I'm like, you know, you're six years old, so you, you're basically doing what your mom tells you to do. Right, right, so I, right. I really didn't have like deep conversations with my mom or, or the doctor about the surgery. It was like, you're going to have the surgery. Like there, there was no like debate about it. You were going to have the surgery. So I had the surgery. I mean, I really didn't want to have the surgery because right. there was a lot of rehab and all this other stuff that, that was involved with it. But what, if I would have known what I know now, I, even at six, if they would have told me what I was going to be able to do afterward, I'd be like, yeah, let's have it now. I mean, let's right, uh, right. Let's, let's keep it going. So um, I, I was at that point to answer your question, Kim, I started to feel like the other kids. Uh, right. Until that point, I never felt like the other kids. I always felt that they were above me in, in every way. I always thought they were above me. And that – moment of running in PE uh, told me that I am just like everybody else. It, 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 you hit the nail on the head. It, it was a, a pivotal, pivotal moment in my life. I felt like I was one of the kids. I didn't feel that way before that. No, totally. And I realized you were six, Paul, but it sounds like this was so pivotal that through some of these other experiences you shared that that six-year-old experience transferred you know, to your mortgage self and your, you know, it, that, you know, you, you kind of broke through a wall. I would say yes. Like, yeah. I mean that, that definitely catapulted me through the baseball thing, but, but I still, at that point when I made the goal for the baseball, I, I still didn't have that much confidence in myself. I think I, to me, the pivotal point for me was, was that journey of playing so much freaking baseball. I played so much. <laughs> to the point where like i felt like my arm was going to fall off but i was like i i uh, like i can't stop you know and it may be silly for me to do it now thinking about it, but i was i was playing so much baseball and um because um at that point in time before even i i even said that to the coach about making my varsity baseball team um i started gaining friendships that, that i didn't have before through baseball and um I was enjoying that. And I thought if I stopped playing one for my goal and two, if I stopped playing, uh, you know, I lost these friendships that I started gaining with the, with the baseball. And, um, it allowed me, um, a, a space where I enjoyed the journey. And I, and I think about that through, you know, my life, especially through having, being, having my own business now, of that, of, of enjoying that journey. Cause you know, like, like I told you before, like there was a, a few years where I wasn't making much money. Um, and, um, I just remember, Hey, it, uh, the journey, it's about the journey. It's it, it, you got to enjoy the journey. And I wasn't enjoying the journey. And when I made that, that pivot, uh, of enjoying the journey, uh, things started opening up for me. Oh, see, that is huge. I absolutely love that. That's like a double, Double snap right there. Yep, because snap. Where going, well, where I was going next to Paul is because the the this phenomenal coach, this you know rock solid awesome human being, sounds like really sort of uh, was a catalyst for your growth too, right? And the accountability piece, I wrote that, that I jotted that down to make sure I didn't lose it because I think that is something that's super transferable 
to our, our listeners. Obviously, Paul is an entrepreneur now, and that's actually how we met was in our the Rising Tide entrepreneurial awesome group, right? Yep. And whether people out there are entrepreneurs or not, I don't, I don't think that even matters, but because it's so relatable, the accountability thing, and I think it's relatable to basically anyone, right, with, with yep. our growth. And so I'm wondering if, if you can talk about how maybe what that did for you and how essential that is for us to, to have that accountability piece when we're trying to reach goals. I, I think it's, it's, it's uh, quite a bit. I think that um, for me with goals and, and I work with a lot of high school athletes now with goals and college athletes on goals. And, and I tell them this, I go, it's not a goal. If it's not written out or people don't know about it, if it's just in your head, Right. That's a dream. There Once you it's written out or, or on your phone, I mean, or on your phone, whatever, whatever. As long as you can see it or you tell people about this goal or, or you, it now becomes reality because now it's in the open. Now the universe knows about this, the, the, this goal. Um, and, and, it, and, it, and there's a vulnerability about that, right? That it's written out or you start telling people about this goal because now people are going to be asking you about this goal. You know, whatever the goal right, is, right. they're going to say, oh, you know, when they see you, they're like, oh, how's your goal going? And you don't want to be like, and that goes, I guess, the kind of to the accountability piece. You don't want to go, oh, man, well, I'm not doing anything with it. You know, that right, right, right. comes to the accountability, like, oh, I'm going to see uh, Jim tomorrow. You know, I better, you know, step up my game with this goal that I'm doing because, you know, I don't want to be like, well, I set this goal and I'm not doing anything with it. So. I, I think it's it's huge to to put it out there uh, where other people can um, can know about your goal because of the fact that there could be times where it's real easy to you know put the covers over your head and go oh, you know what I'm not going to do it today right, but, right. If, but if you're if other people know about it and uh, and are keeping you accountable for it you're like okay well yeah I love to have my covers over my head but you know what. I promised this person I would get X, Y, and Z done. So right, right, right. take the covers off and get X, Y, and Z done before I see this person tomorrow. Right, you got to out yourself because yeah. uh, we've had a, a couple of I've had a couple more of our um, of our mastermind friends that said something similar with an entirely different context, and both of them were talking about weight loss journeys. I think that fits there. I mean, I think mm -hmm. a lot of people can relate to maybe the natural very human nature to want to stick your head under the covers. But, but if you want to reach the goal, you out yourself mm -hmm. blankets off. Yeah. Then you're more apt to kick it into gear. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it, it gives you that extra motivation. And that's what that coach was, was basically telling me, you know, like you can keep this to yourself and it, it ain't going to work. But if everybody, everybody knows, if everybody knows that this is, this is your goal and they see you slacking off, they're going to tell you, Hey, 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 remember your goal, get back on, or get back, get back on it, get back on it. And that's what happened. I mean, there was times where, you know, I'm a kid, I'm a teenager, man. I mean, there's times where I wasn't like feeling it, man. I, I <laughs> but then you had your, your other teammates and your coaching staff right, right, and right. everyone, Hey, remember your goal. You're not going to get your goal doing that. And then, you know, that would snap me out. Or, okay, you know, let me get back to where I'm supposed to do. You know, and teenagers, but I think, you know, a lot of us need that. And we actually have another, they have another one of our friends in the group who actually hired an accountability coach for herself early on in, in, with her business. And I'm thinking, Paul, lastly, because you've actually, what you're currently doing, maybe we can say a little bit about that, because you, what your coach did for you, you're now doing for other you're doing for for like high school age kids, I think, teenagers. High school, high school, college athletes. In yeah. sports, yeah. So maybe you can tell us how you've brought what you've gained with your own pen and your own story to help them figure out their pen to write their own story. I can sum it up in in one word that 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 helps me with them is the word empathy. I love. I that. can relate to them. I can relate right. to what the, what they're saying and and. Um, when I was first in this in this journey of this, coaching adults, coaching athletes, whatever, I thought I was supposed to be as a coach, supposed to give advice, this and that. And um, I quickly realized that's not the case. Not to give advice. I mean, sometimes I do, but not that often. 
what my job is, is, is the philosophy of that person, whether it's an athlete or an adult or whoever they are, they have the answers inside of them. Right, right, right. And it's up to me to ask the proper questions to pull it out of them because it means way more to the individual when they come up with it than, than, than I come up with. But more than, more than any of that nature, I allow a non-judgmental space for these athletes to just express their feelings. Right. And allow them to get out. And, and me just actively listen to them, knowing that, knowing that, uh, that they're, they're the theme of it, you know, that, that I'm, I don't have any other agenda but to listen to them which allows them a, a, a nice comfortable space where they can just share. And as I look at it now, um, uh, I like this analogy. I think of these athletes or whoever I'm coaching as a vehicle, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whether it's a gas pile vehicle, electric, doesn't matter, right? And I'm either the electric station or the gas station, right? And, and they're on empty. And then they come to me, you know, and I, and I, I fill them back up in their tank and then they're back out and they get back to where they want to be like, okay, now I'm ready to go. And that, and that's how I, I look at myself. I, I look at myself as like the ultimate hype man um, that, that I just want to, I build them up. I, I listen to what they say and I pick out a lot of that positivity that they're saying and I throw it at them and I, and, and I throw it at them in a different angle and they're like, Oh geez, Paul, you know what? I, I wish I thought of myself as well as you thought of myself. And I go, you should think about yeah, yourself yeah. the way I think of you because that's who you are. Right. And, and we are, you know, we have thousands and thousands of thoughts in our heads and all of them don't have to be your reality. You know, we, we can pick and choose what thoughts we want to make our reality. And, and that's what I, I, I stress to, to everybody that I coach and all my friends and such. I think that is huge. You know, cause that's, you know, I've talked a lot, Paul and, um, kind of a theme with the, the others too, is a lot of people, not just teenagers are kind of in that life stage of being so concerned with what people think kind of naturally, but yeah. even older seasoned adults, I think often it seems often forget that we're in control here. Like yeah. we can choose and kind of recognize that's just thought chatter being generated by whatever's that going on out there or it's in here but I don't have to stay with that thought. I can leave it alone and shift into a new thought. And I think we can forget that sometimes. And then the thought, of course, dictates the feelings. And then we can go down a rabbit hole so fast. So I think the fact that you're doing that with teenagers is incredible. Yeah, and it goes back to that point that, that we made in the beginning of the, uh, of the podcast is, is taking back our pen. And writing the story for ourselves, not for anybody else, and, right. and, and that's and that's so true. Um, it's it's easy, and there was times in my life where I've given up that pen and allowed other people to write my story for me. Um, but no, don't do you it. Know, we have one life to live. We are the author of the story, so take back that pen and start writing the story that you want for yourself, not for anybody else, but for yourself. What lights you up, and that's that's what it's all about. Oh, this is fantastic, Paul. I think that's a wonderful place to wind up because you crushed it there with the ending kind of closing statement. So nowhere to go, but, you know, just because that's you, you nailed it right there. So what I want to say is just thank you so much, Paul, for, you know, spending your life minutes in this way to reach out to so many people. And actually, Minecraft, the last I checked, is listened to in about 52 countries or something. And it's you are super relatable. So I have no doubt listeners are going to uh, love it and maybe want to contact you. So anyone who does want to get more from, from Mr. Paul Fortune, I will leave his uh, contact information in the blurb below and you can reach out in that way. So thank you so much, Paul. Kim, it's been a pleasure. I love talking with you.